Tonight, decision day. India's elections kick off as millions head to the polls, with Modi preparing to take home yet another win to the dismay of the opposition. Returning fire. Israel finally responds to Iran's attacks as tensions escalate to dangerous levels in the region. Global leaders continue to urge calm to no avail. Trial time. Trump's hush money trial completes the juror selection process. Trump making his enthusiasm, or lack thereof, in the proceedings exceedingly clear. And on point for glory. Ballerinas from across the globe attempt to set a world record with one of ballet's most iconic moves. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ala Verna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening, you're joining us on World News on our final bulletin for the week. We have quite a bit to get you up to date on relating to key global issues that unfolded over the past 24 hours. So without any further ado, let's get started with our top story on India's elections. Now, India began voting in a six-week election with an all-but-assured victory for Hindu Nationalist Prime Minister Narendra Modi as a weakened opposition was pushed to the sidelines. All over India, election officials like these are setting off, equipped with electronic voting machines, ballot boxes and control units. Their mission is to set up polling booths across 28 states or union territories to make sure voters in each corner of the sprawling nation can go to the polls. Officials are travelling by road, boat and even military helicopters to remote areas in the rugged Himalayas and the central Indian constituency of Gadchiroli Shimur, which is beset by Maoist violence. With a total of nearly 970 million registered voters, it's the world's and history's largest ever election. To ease the logistical burden, voting is staggered over 44 days. 102 of 543 constituencies will vote on Friday in the first of seven phases. The second phase will be on April 26th. Voting will close on June 1st and results counted and announced on the 4th. And now we move our focus to the developments in the Israel-Iran conflict. A move has finally been made. Israel has carried out a military strike on Iran, a potentially dangerous escalation in a fast-widening Middle East conflict that Iranian officials have so far sought to play down. Israel has struck back at Iran. That was according to three sources on Friday. Iranian state media reported explosions near an army base in the central city of Isfahan, and said drones were shot down. Reports said nearby nuclear facilities in Natanz, which the West suspects are involved in developing atomic weapons, were not damaged. The apparent strike comes days after Iran fired hundreds of drones into Israel in retaliation for the attack on the Iranian embassy in Damascus in Syria. Most of Iran's drones and missiles were downed before reaching Israeli territory. There was no comment from Israel on the reports of an attack. Iran's Foreign Minister Hussein Amir Abdullahian on Thursday had told the United Nations Security Council that Israel should refrain from any action. Iran state media says flights have been suspended over several cities. Flight tracking sites showed some airliners making sharp turns away from the country's airspace in the early hours of Friday. Israel had warned it was going to retaliate against Iran's April 13 missile and drone attack. Numerous countries had earned restraint, concerned that any retaliation could spark a broader conflict in the region. One source said the U.S. was notified of the Israeli strike, but not involved. Iran's president has said the country would deliver a severe response to any attack on its territory. Meanwhile, the EU has agreed to expand sanctions on Iranian producers of drones and missiles following Tehran's unprecedented attack on Israel. European Council President Charles Michael said it's very important to do everything to isolate Iran. Meanwhile, European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen also called on Iran, Israel and their allies to refrain from escalation in the Middle East. And for updates on the ground, we have other than the World News Special Correspondent Chatur Jandra from Stockholm in Sweden. Chatur, how has Europe been reacting to the strikes? Yes, I'm ready. 
The bloc already has multiple sanctions in place against Iran, including for selling drones to Russia for using its war against Ukraine. The US has hinted that it will impose its own new penalties in the upcoming days. The EU's new sanctions were agreed upon during a summit in Brussels, which marked the first meeting between the Bloc 27 leaders since Iran's direct assault on Israel. World leaders have continued to urge resistance in a bid to prevent a wider conflict in the Middle East. However, Israel has called on its allies to sanction Tehran's missile program and for the Islamic Revolutionary Guard groups, a major military and political force in Iran, to be designated a terrorist organization. Something in the US has done, but the EU and UK have not. Back to you, Andrade. All right, thank you very much. That was other than a world news special correspondent, Chatra Jander from Stockholm in Sweden. We have some reactions on the regional front now. China spoke against any escalation of tensions in the Middle East after Iran was targeted in an aerial attack. At a regular press briefing in Beijing, Lin Jian, a spokesperson for China's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, said China opposes any behavior that may further escalate tensions. On the response to the strikes by Israel, several countries had already warned that a retaliatory attack in response to recent Iranian attacks could risk dragging the entire region into a wider regional war. Along with this development, Chinese Foreign Minister spokesperson Lin Jian said that China firmly supports Palestine in becoming a formal member state of the United Nations, potentially causing some headway in easing the trilateral tensions in the region. Lin added that they will continue to work with all relevant parties to make unremitting efforts to calm the situation as soon as possible. Short commercial break now and when we return, details on the Trump trials and much more. Stay tuned. Welcome back. We continue to bring you updates on Trump's legal troubles. Lawyers in Donald Trump's historic criminal trial in New York have selected all 12 jurors. The panel will assess Trump's guilt or innocence over the coming weeks in a case stemming from a hush money payment made to a porn star. But more than the focus on the trial, Trump seems to have drawn attention with his quite drowsy response to court proceedings. Lawyers for the defense and the prosecution must still select alternate jurors for the trial the first ever in which a former U.S. president is the defendant. Judge Juan Merchant said opening statements could take place as early as Monday. Trump's outsized public presence created unique problems during the jury selection process. Roughly half of the nearly 200 jurors screened in heavily Democratic Manhattan were dismissed after saying they could not assess the evidence impartially. Trump's criticism of witnesses, prosecutors, the judge, and their relatives in this case prompted Merchant to expand an existing gag order earlier this month. However, an indignant Trump continued to rail against the trial as he left court for the day on Thursday, calling it, quote, very unfair and displaying a stack of news reports he said agreed with him. The whole world is watching this hoax. You got a DA that's out of control. You have a judge that's highly conflicted. The whole thing is a mess, and you have the leading candidate and leading crooked Joe Biden by a lot. He's the one that should be in trial. He's a crook. you got a crooked president. Experts say Trump would use a not guilty verdict in the case as vindication. A conviction would not bar him from taking office. We have to give 10... Trump is also facing three other criminal cases as he prepares for a rematch with U.S. President Joe Biden in November's presidential election. But the New York case is the only one certain to go to trial this year. Trump has pleaded not guilty in all four cases. And on the road to the White House tonight, Joe Biden has extended his lead in the presidential money race as his cash pile keeps growing faster than Donald Trump's. Biden raised almost twice as much as Trump from January to the end of March. Meanwhile, in a rebuke of Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s independent bid for the White House, 
15 members of the Kennedy family also endorsed U.S. President Joe Biden at a campaign event in Philadelphia. For more on this, we have other than the World News special correspondent Suzanne Shanali from Toronto in Canada. Shanali, run us through some numbers. What's it looking like? And Radhi, it seems the president has raised $368 million so far this election cycle, with $146 million in cash on hand at the end of March. Meanwhile, Trump has brought in $219 million so far. In another troubling sign for Republican fundraising efforts, Trump has 270,000 fewer unique donors than he did at the same stage of his 2020 White House run. His campaign and affiliated political action committees got money from 900,000 donors from July 2023 to the end of the first quarter in 2024, down to 1.17 billion four years earlier. The shrinking donor base leaves questions about how Trump will sustain the costs of his legal battles on top of what is expected to be the most expensive presidential race in U.S. history. Anuradhi, the bottom line is that he needs to step it up now when it comes to fundraising, especially while he's stuck in court and off the campaign trail. Over to you. I guess we'll have to wait and see exactly how the funding difference will play out in the near future. Thank you very much. That was other than a World News special correspondent Suzanne Shanali from Toronto in Canada. And an update on the violence in Australia. A 16-year-old boy has been charged with a terrorism offence for allegedly stabbing an Assyrian church bishop in Sydney during a church service. Australian police also said that they are investigating a riot that occurred following the stabbing. Counter-terrorism police questioned the boy in a hospital on Thursday and charged him with committing a terrorist act. Police Commissioner Karen Webb said during a press conference that he's been denied bail and is set to appear in a bedside court hearing on Friday. A riot erupted outside the church after the attack on Bishop Mar Marie Emanuel, after the crowd demanded that police hand over the attacker. Over 50 officers were injured and 20 police cars were damaged. The 53-year-old bishop has a popular youth following on TikTok but faces controversy over his views. His sermons cover Bible teachings and critique homosexuality, COVID vaccines, Islam, and Joe Biden's presidency. Emmanuel says in an audio message on social media on Thursday that he had forgiven his attacker and was recovering quickly. Whatever has happened to me personally, I thank the Lord Jesus. It's, it's a huge blessing for me. I, uh, I forgive whoever has done this uh, act. And I say to him, you're my son, I love you, and I will always pray for you. And whoever sent you to do this, I forgive them as well, in Jesus' mighty name. Two knife attacks in three days have shaken residents of Australia's largest city. Six people were killed in a separate incident at a mall. The incidents prompted calls for increased public security in Australia, where strict laws have kept gun crimes and knife attacks rare. Over to the Russia-Ukraine conflict now. In Ukraine, at least 17 people were reportedly killed in Russia's missile attack on the city of Cherniv. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky reiterated his calls for air defense support from the West. Ukrainian officials report that at least 17 people were killed on Wednesday local time in a Russian missile attack on Chernihiv, a city in northern Ukraine. This prompted President Vladimir Zelensky to once again appeal for air defense support from Kyiv's allies. According to the emergency services, more than 60 people, including three children, were injured in the attack. Officials said the strike damaged buildings, cars and other infrastructure. Acting Mayor Oleksandr Lomako said that a busy area of the city was hit by three explosions shortly after 9 a.m. local time. And on national television, he stated that, unfortunately, Russia continues to engage in terrorist activity against civilians and civilian infrastructure, as confirmed by the strike on Chernihiv once again. Ukrainian President Zelensky reiterated his plea for support from Western countries, emphasizing the need for sufficient assistance from its partners. He stated on his social media that this would not have happened if Ukraine had received a sufficient number of air defense systems and if the world's determination to counter Russian terror had been sufficient. Meanwhile, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg announced that President Zelensky has requested a meeting of the NATO-Ukraine Council. The meeting will be held on Friday, first with President Zelensky and then with NATO defense ministers to discuss the urgent need for additional support to Ukraine, particularly air defense. 
Moscow did not provide an immediate comment on the attack and has denied deliberately targeting civilians since its invasion of Ukraine two years ago. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news right after this. Stay tuned. Welcome back. The final story we have to report to you tonight comes with a very high dose of artistic expression. We have a new world record for most ballerinas going on point. The move is no easy feat in itself, but with 500 dancers and their logistics are intricate as it is awe-inspiring. Take a look. Three, two, one. These dancers have taken a grand jeté into the record books. 500 ballerinas from around the world gathered inside the terrace room at the famous Plaza Hotel in New York City. They donned pink leotards and practiced tutus for an important reason, to see if this company could releve into setting a new record for a difficult and sometimes painful accomplishment. The most dancers on point for an entire minute at the same time. Keep going. 10, 9, 8, 3, and 3, 2, 1. Going on point is a technique where a dancer balances on their toes in specially designed shoes. It takes years of training and the perfect combination of muscle strength and flexibility for a dancer to be ready to go on point. Maintaining proper body alignment and foot placement is key to avoiding injuries while dancing on point. And the record to repeat is 306. And your final result is 353. That means a new Guinness World Records title. Congratulations! Congratulations, dancers. You now hold Guinness World Record. These tiptoed ballerinas were organized by dance competition group Youth America Grand Prix. The previous Guinness record was set in 2019, featuring many professional dancers. I mean, a question does arise on whether all the dancers were successful, but it is a pleasing sight in its own right. Well, that wraps up our bulletin tonight here at World News. Join us again on Monday for more key global updates. Thank you very much for watching. Have a great weekend ahead.